Calaroga Shark Media. Okay, Nikki Glazer, publicist, you've earned your money. Hello, I'm Johnny Mac with your daily comedy news from The Hollywood Reporter. How Nikki Glazer became the new queen of comedy. Now, before we even dive in, um, who would be the queen of comedy right now if not Nikki Glazer? So it's not an absurd premise. She crushed at the roast of Tom Brady. Who would you throw up there? Amy Schumer? Sarah? One of the SNL performers? So this is not absurd. The subheadline, the Tom Brady roast MVP, that's true, and stand-up comedian got the Emmy nod for Someday You'll Die, which attracted the largest debut for an HBO comedy special in two years. On to the wax job from The Hollywood Reporter. Nikki said of her special Someday You'll Die, I just kind of knew it was going to be nominated for an Emmy. I hate to sound crazy. The roast was such a big moment for me, and my life changed overnight in terms of recognizability and people knowing who I am. As for the timing, she says it wasn't intentional that the roast was going to give this special a boost. That was never planned. I mean, I'll jump in. I, I can't argue with HBO if they're saying it is the uh, most whatever in two years. But I didn't feel any buzz on that this week. Uh, despite the Emmy nod, despite this Hollywood reporter, I haven't heard anybody buzzing about that special. Are they buzzing about the roast of Tom Brady and her appearance on that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Has she crushed it on various podcasts? Sure. Um, but for the special, I don't know. Just I, I, I didn't see it in the zeitgeist and I do do this every day. According to Glazer, she'd been speaking it into existence for months Nikki says, I was really into manifestation in the fall when I was putting this all together. I just kept saying, my special is going to be nominated. My special is going to win an Emmy. I guess I need to win to really make this manifestation happen. The material took me a while to get to a place where it was working the way I wanted to because of the nature of the things I was talking about. It's not like I engineer a special to fit what I think people need to hear or there's some gap in the cultural consciousness. In previous specials, Glazer had dipped in here and there with jokes about not wanting kids and reaction to her material was like, you're going to change your mind or it's early for you to make that kind of call. Nikki said, I knew I couldn't take myself seriously about it because I thought, you know, maybe I will. The article then talks about her current confidence in comedy. I'm kind of Malcolm Gladwelling this. I'm reaching close to those 10,000 hours. What do I really want to say? The subject of fertility made it into her stand-up material because it had become a hot topic on a group chat with nine of her best friends, ranging from fellow comedians to childhood friends. Glazer says, literally 24 hours a day, there's someone on it that'll help you through your problems. Glazer says the women take three vacations together each year. Do all nine make the vacation? That's hard to coordinate. I can't even get my entire family in one room for dinner. One topic that kept coming up was her friends wanting to have children. Nikki says she couldn't relate. I'm usually on par with the wants and desires of my friends that I've had for my whole life, except here I couldn't fathom why you would want kids, and I just felt left out. It's the first time I've ever felt like someone who isn't a Taylor Swift fan. Must feel about Taylor Swift fans. Here we go again. See yesterday's podcast. What people say to me, I just don't get it. We explain it to me. I don't know how to explain it to those people because the feeling I have about Taylor Swift is beyond words. Nikki says, it was hard to have those jokes about not wanting my friends to have kids and have my friends see those jokes. I wrote the jokes before I told my friends that the jokes are in the special, but they understand and says the jokes did not affect anything in regard to their friends' pregnancies. My joke is, you have a better purpose than I'll ever have. My purpose now is talking to Conan O'Brien about my labia. From Variety, Ellie King opened up about her tumultuous relationship with her father, Rob Schneider. King said of Rob Schneider, I disagree with a lot of the things he says. You're talking out of your ass and you're talking crap about drag and, you know, anti-gay rights. And it's like, get effed. King said she was not close to her father growing up and didn't connect with Rob Schneider until she was much, much older. When she had the opportunity to spend time with Rob, it was on a movie set where she would get lost in the shuffle. If I ever messed up a shot, if I was talking, I would get in effing trouble. A big source of tension between King and Schneider was her appearance. King says, I was like a really, really heavy child. My dad sent me to fat camp, and then I got in trouble one year because I sprained my ankle and didn't lose any weight. I had already started getting tattooed, and it was like 108 degrees, so I had to wear sweaters because my dad was very anti-tattoos or any form of self-expression. She has no plans to mend the relationship with Rob Schneider, saying she does not want to be associated with Rob Schneider. He's just not nice. You can want someone to change so much, you can control anyone else's actions, and you can't control people's feelings. All you can control is how you react and what you do with your feelings. Changing gears, Triumph the Insult Comic Dog tweets, My all-new Let's Make a Poop Chicago edition is on YouTube.com slash Team Coco. With former Governor Rod Blagojevich, ex-cub Ryan Dempster, some people from the WGN Morning News, and Wiener Circle's own Poochie Jackson, also Marjorie Jokes. 
And let me get this one in here before it gets too moldy. Vulture wrote, hire Matt Berry as a 2028 LA Olympics commentator. Now, this made me smile because during the pandemic, Vulture once a week would write an article suggesting a job for Matt Berry. And I would do those stories on Sunday. And it really helped to kill off, you know, during the pandemic, there was not all that much news. And I was doing this seven days a week. So sometimes I had to dig deep. And I remember doing that every Sunday and doing, uh, at the time, a reasonably half-assed Matt Berry impression. I'll see if it comes back today. I haven't done it probably since then. But Vulture writes, Finding celebrities won't be a challenge for an Olympics happening in L.A., but just having famous people around isn't enough. You need to have the right kind of famous people. And L.A. is a town easily prone to overbooking the wrong kind of famous people. L.A.'s inherent bias towards shiny, happy people risks the overrepresentation of people like Paris Hilton and Mario Lopez. No. You need people who are universally beloved, but also interesting to see because they have a mysterious, slightly dark presence. A good Olympic celebrity mix includes his choices that make viewers say, what? Why? And Matt Berry is that. He's a cult icon who'll take off one shoe to play a scary guitar solo. And for a celebrity, is rarely seen. And he's no stranger to big events like this either. He lent his voice to the London Olympics closing ceremony in 2012. Barry recently spoke to The Hollywood Reporter in which he admitted something stellar. Matthew Barry said, I did an edit here. I tried to do my Matt Barry. It's gone. I can't do it. So I'll do it as me. Most of the names I pronounce incorrectly aren't on purpose. It's because I don't know what they are, especially sports, all these ball games, baseball, softball. I haven't got a clue what any of that is. Barry should be included in the LA Olympics because he's a symbol of cooperation between six different countries. Great Britain, which is three countries, England, Scotland, and Wales. Canada, where he filmed What We Do in the Shadows. The United States, where that shows a hit. And Estonia a country he recently enjoyed visiting on vacation. Hey, we've got a new show. It's called Five Minutes of Gratitude. What is it, Johnny Mac? Well, it's Five Minutes of Gratitude. It's in the title. You listen, it's five minutes long, and you think about being grateful for things in your life. It's good for your mental health, feeling good about yourself. Five Minutes of Gratitude, wherever you get your shows. Let's see who's at the Columbus Comedy Festival today. A lot of shows. Let's see. Wow, it's 7 o'clock. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 shows. Uh, I would go see Irene T with the key at 7 o'clock. Jim Florentine at The Attic at 8, and then your 10 o'clock shows, Chloe Radcliffe at The Key, Alex Falcone at CPAC, Mandy McKilvey at The Key, and Chad the Bird at CPAC. So yeah, let's do Irene 2, and then we'll do Chloe Radcliffe at 10, and then we don't have to go anywhere. We can probably grab a drink in between. The 800-pound gorilla promotes their own special. It's Lewis Black's Thanks for Risking Your Life. That's now on YouTube. You may recall on March 13th, 2020, the King of Rants knew the world around him would never be the same. There was a pandemic. Did you hear about it? Google it. It was, it was kind of a big deal. Some people with podcasts had to do Matt Berry stories every week. Performed just days after the country shut down, Lewis Black talks about the corona-induced anxiety and his own hilarious frustration over the uh, orange one who must not be named. Black doesn't take political sides, whether he's exposing the widespread systematic failure of both parties or pinpointing the micro-stupidities within pop culture. Rising comedian Matt Matthews announced his Bougie on a Budget Tour, 52 Cities. That tour kicks off October 25th, Live Nation promoting this one. Known for his relatable situational humor, Matt Matthews discusses a variety of topics and personal experiences in his stand-up, including his daily life of living on a farm, his career as a bourgeois photographer, relationships, and more. He will also bring his popular Confessions with Matt video series to the live stage where he provides a real-time comedic take on audience members who voluntarily spill their deepest, darkest secrets. Matt Matthews told Deadline, Growing up a broke gay kid from the South, I always dreamed of being a performer, but let's be real, those big dreams don't typically come true. Thankfully, I decided to take the risk and bet on myself as a comedian never in my life did I imagine that I would sign an incredible deal with Live Nation. Got that plug in. Kiss the ring for a second headlining tour. I couldn't do this without the incredible support of fans. And I'm so excited, honored, and humbled that so many people believe in me. Can't wait to be back on that stage. Bougie on a budget is going to be wild. And he spelled wild with four Ds. Chortle spoke to Katie Green. She's at the Edinburgh Fringe, and she picked her perfect playlist of comedy favorites. Okay, Uh, first up on the perfect playlist of comedy favorites is Gerard Carmichael's Love at the Store. Gerard was the first comedian I first saw live that really moved me. I'd never seen a performer be so captivating. He was more than funny. He was pensive and deep, and he handled the crowd so well. Next up, Mitch Hedberg's Mitch Altogether. Do you see the hedberg happening? How often are we talking about Mitch Hedberg all of a sudden? It's happening. She says, when I started comedy, I didn't know much about stand-up, so I used to go to the library and check out comedy albums on CD. That makes me sound old, but my first car only had a CD player. 
Mitch was always my favorite to listen to because he was so talented and the jokes were so clever. I also like how he addresses the fact that the album's going to be on CD by saying things like, this will be track five or this won't be good for the CD. It makes it so funny. His albums are great to listen to while driving. I agree. He made the most everyday things so funny. I never pass a broken escalator and not think of an escalator can never break. It can only become stairs. <laughs> you know what? Same thing. I all, Anytime I see an escalator that is not running, I think of Mitch Hedberg. Also, if I'm ever at an amusement park, like say Disney, and I see a frozen banana stand, do you know the joke? Do you want a frozen banana? No, but I might want a regular banana later. All right. Uh, she likes Cristela Alonso's Lower Classy. Her bit about Selena Quintanilla being the closest thing Latinos have to a superhero is so funny because it's so true. I love her stories about growing up, and I definitely look up to her. Aziz Ansari, uh, you know, he was canceled at one point. Aziz is a modern romance. I know this is a book, but I do like to read, so I'll put it in my playlist. Modern Romance is probably my favorite book about dating, and trust me, I've read a lot. Dating advice from Aziz Ansari? That's interesting. Move on. And also on her list is... Bob's Burgers? She says, I love Bob's Burgers. My guilty pleasure is watching Bob's Burgers while eating a burger. See, now this whole list is fake because, listener, especially if you're new, I'm going to ask you two questions. One, have you ever actually seen Bob's Burgers? You haven't. I know you've seen promos. I know you've seen t-shirts. I know you've seen merch. I know you've seen artwork on your streaming app. You've never actually seen Bob's Burgers. And, and more interestingly, have you ever met anyone who's seen Bob's Burgers? You haven't. I know there's like an icon on Netflix or wherever, but you've never clicked it. No one has ever clicked it. There's no such show is Bob's Burgers, allegedly in season 15 or something. Anyway, she says the show is so relatable because my family has a restaurant and I worked there when I was younger, so it's so funny to see the Belcher family dynamic. I just love animated shows like Rick and Morty, but Bob's Burgers takes the win. And that's your comedy news for today. If you enjoy the program, tell a friend about it. They might like it too, and I'll see you tomorrow.